We're here at Create this week and we're recording some very special podcasts for Nations Restaurant News. We're going to be interviewing eight different executives from restaurants and also from the investor community to explore different themes from each of the chapters of the Path to Digital Maturity. Uh, today we are joined and thrilled to have Andrew Smith, who is the managing partner and co-founder at Savory Fund. Andrew is a former tech entrepreneur that then got into restaurant ownership and investment with chains like Mo Better's, Pincho, and my personal favorite, Tr Crack Shack, which back in our Kitchen United days was our go-to place for lunch. And so, uh, Incredible. yeah, we, we love People always ask, Crack Shack, what do you serve there? It's like, well, it's not what you think. <laughs> yeah, it's indeed. It's, a, it's, a, it's great. So today we're going to talk, Andrew, about some of the themes from our third chapter, Mind Data. Uh, as they say, data is the new oil, and uh, I suspect you and your team have to go through lots of it to make the decisions you have to make on a daily basis, so looking forward to getting into it. Yeah, so we're particularly interested to have you talk about this because of your tech background, and we think restaurants are moving into an era where they're really becoming e-commerce companies, which they have not been yeah. before, and because of your understanding of tech and bringing that vertical with you to the restaurant industry, we think we'll, you'll have a pretty unique perspective here. Maybe. Uh, hopefully. We'll I don't know. We'll <laughs> see. Yeah. So first question is just, you have several different restaurant brands across mm -hmm. the portfolio. How do you handle the enormity of data that comes in with each transaction across all of those brands? Well, first, to be completely honest, when I got in the industry 15 years ago, I remember coming from the tech industry. And I remember the first restaurant we built, we were franchisees, and we had this shelf that was up above the drive through window, and there was this little box on there, and it would print out orders, right? And they would come in like a little Dead Sea Scrolls. Mm -hmm. and you'd open it up, and I'm like, well, what the heck is this? And they're like, well, that's your, that's your catering order. And so it was coming in on a fax machine. And so going from 15 years ago until today, it is unbelievable to see how much tech has actually been layered into this industry. and. I think that with all tech, even when I was in the tech industry, the thing that you have to do is you have to break it down. So even if I have multiple brands with multiple layers of different regions and states and people working on it and different customer profiles, and you really have to break it down into what you're trying to decide on and look at that data specifically for that part of the business and then go to the next part of the business and look at that data. If you look at all of it, it's pretty enormous and it is, it's overwhelming. Um, so you have to break it down. That's so you think the, about it as uh, what business decision am I trying to make? How am I trying to yeah. impact the business? Then let me go find the data that's relevant to that question. Correct. And some of them work interchangeably, right? You have to understand all of them, but um, we just break them down. So we're not thinking about all nine of our brands and the hundreds of restaurants we have. We, we look at what is the specific thing we're trying to solve and then what's the data that supports it. Oh, that's very interesting because I think there is a big movement in the restaurant industry right now to consolidate brands, put them all under an umbrella under the theory that there are certain things that can be shared, like finance and HR, but mm -hmm. also IT and maybe how we think about data and loyalty, things like that. Yeah. But each brand has its own unique personality, has a different set of consumers, a different frequency rate uh, for the brand. And so while some of the uh, technology and approaches might be shared, the individual questions are going to be unique. Yeah, it's it would be much easier if all of it worked the same, right? But every single brand is completely different. And you know, when you look at real estate, for instance, and you're going out to try to find real estate, people say, do you just go out there and stand there and kind of go like this in the sky? And <laughs> you do do that. I mean, you have to have some gut instinct about it. But boy, you, you look at so much data, demographic data, uh, sociographic data, and that data is not the same across the board, right? So you, then who's your customer? How are they communicating with you? How do they want to dine with you? All of that is very individualistic to each of the brands out there. And I wish it was a little bit more the mm. same, but it's not. All of them are unique. I suspect it's even more challenging these days as well, because it's not just about the location where the restaurant is, because of course you're servicing customers three to five miles away from where that location actually is. And I guess that leads to our next question, which is around the fact that restaurant companies today are becoming e-commerce companies. Yeah. And when we, we learn from what other industries have taught us about e-commerce, 
Where do restaurants stand today on utilizing e-commerce, data e-commerce metrics to make better decisions? Yeah, I think that we're still a little behind. I mean, I, I think that with the, the thing that happened in 2020, we don't like to say the word anymore because it's, it was awful. BC. But yes. Um, <laughs> but during that time, though, I, I think that uh, three or four years of technology was jammed down everybody's throat in two years, right? And I think that the consumer, they adopted pretty quickly, too, because they had to. Nobody became Betty Crocker overnight, so they were like, holy cow, how do I get my food still? And so I think that everybody has adopted quickly, um, much quicker than I think was was happening uh, previously. But I think still nowadays, people are still thinking, well, do I have to go to the restaurant to get it or can I order it on? Do I, do I order it on a 3PD app or do I order it directly with the restaurant? Can I go out to Google and just order it through Google as well? There's still a little bit of learning curve, I think, for a lot of consumers. Because you have to remember, a lot of uh, consumers out there, there are different levels of understanding of technology too. When I was a technologist, you would always have to build something to the lowest common denominator. Mm -hmm. You always have to build it to the person that's, you wouldn't say the dumbest, but just the person that understands technology the, little, the, the least. Doesn't know as much. They don't yeah. know as much. And so, although I would say, you know, my mom is on you know, Facebook and probably runs that better than I even know how to use Facebook, right? So you can't just say the age is the issue, it's just the understanding of technology. Mm -hmm. And so building things so that it's at the lowest common denominator is what I always say. And right now, I think that we still have a lot of learning curve issues with our consumers for all brands. I really do. Well, and it's so fragmented. Even the example you just gave, first party ordering, third party ordering, order through Google. There's so many different ways to do it. Give us one portal. Yeah. Even, want if, one. even yeah. if I am a sophisticated <laughs> consumer, yeah, it's, it's different for every brand and everywhere yeah. I go. So it is um, legitimately quite fragmented. right? Yeah, it is still fragmented. I think it's coming together better. And I think the aggregators out there that are pulling the other technologies to bring them all into one, they're still trying to figure it out. I mean, APIs with every single one of those technologies are not perfect. Right. And having those bridges to all those technologies, those don't always support what you want and they're not as smooth as you'd like them to be. Yeah, that's true. The industry today uh, has very much been sold on this open API, everything should talk to each other and then it will be fine. <laughs> <laughs> those, those integrations don't always go well no, and they, they become more complex the more of them they that do. you have, for sure. Uh, so, as we uh, increasingly transition into an e-commerce world, we start using words that are much more familiar to technology than they are to restaurants. Things like LTB to CAC, mm -hmm. uh, which is something that I think we all throw around in software all the time, and restaurants are just starting to think about, well, what do those words, what do those letters even stand for? What do they mean? How do we think about them? How do we calculate them? And so, for your restaurant brands, how do you think about, let's just start with customer lifetime value. How do you think about how valuable a customer is to the brand? Yeah, especially now where traffic is a little slower. I mean, everybody that says that they're doing just fine is probably lying at this point. Well, the industry is flat to down. It's so. flat to down right now. And so I think even more so than, than ever before, in order to think that people are looking for, well, how do I get my consumer to come back more often? Mm -hmm. So the lifetime value of your customer is probably the most important data set that we look at right now. And the only way you can do that is if you're communicating with them and you know when they're coming in, right? So you really have to invest into and lean into your, your loyalty and your communication tools with your consumer. And following that, when you see them coming in once a week or, you know, we own Swig, so we like to see people come in two or three times a week because yeah. it's a <laughs> habitual thing like coffee is. Um, but if you start seeing them go from three to two to one and then once a month, that's a big problem because trying to get another person in that customer acquisition cost can be very costly mm -hmm. when there's so much noise out there with marketing and social media that investing and leaning into your consumers today is a technology you want to invest into, and we are heavily. And what do you do with that customer lifetime value once you know what it is? What does that enable across the brands? I think that then you look at how you're um, treating the customer when they're there, because that's the most valuable person that you have is the one that's right in front of you. You start thinking, do I spend more money in marketing and outbound, or do I spend more on internal culture, team, training, speed? There are things that you do differently mm. when you say, well, we're losing the customers we already have. Gaining them is really dumb to be focused on. Let's focus on internal operations or what does a consumer want mm. versus trying to get another one. Mm. So the, the long-term value of a consumer for most, for most customers, I don't think people understand this, but most customers, it can be in the thousands to tens of thousands. Yeah. And if you think about that number and you're thinking, well, I'm going to go and spend $20 to try to get a new consumer, or $5 or $1, still times how many thousands of dollars you're spending. It just makes a lot of sense to keep mm. you coming to Swig every day. Absolutely. That's absolutely. what we want. We used to say at Taco Bell that marketing brings them in and operation keeps them coming keeps back. Keeps them coming back. And we're so focused on mm. 
digitization and technology tools and personalization and all the things we can do to communicate with consumers, all these fun new marketing tools that we yeah. have at our fingertips, but really, it's, it's kind of the old school fundamentals that matter. It is, and the thing about Taco Bell, I mean, who's done it better? I don't, I don't know of anybody that's done better. Uh, you think Chick-fil-A has always done it much better than some of the old dogs, but I think Taco Bell is probably one of the best operators because they they're, they're consistent. She'll stall time. Uh, thank you. Stall, oh, <laughs> you, know, you, you, did great. you did great when you guys I, were there. I, <laughs> yeah, I still eat there. I mean, why would you not? Why would you not? <laughs> well, one of the things about lifetime value, though, Andrew, is how, how does this work for something like Savory when you've got like, a plethora of different brands? Do you look at lifetime value across all of the brands, or do you look at it on a brand by brand basis? All brands the same. So we look at all of them from a consumer data set. We look at it with the technologies that are working and not working. And it's interesting. Some of the technologies work with some brands, and they don't as much with other brands. And I think. The crack shack consumer is different than the swig consumer. It's very different than a pincho consumer. Mm -hmm. And it's very different than the Sicilian butcher, which is a sit down, you know, table side Italian restaurant concept. It's a very different consumer that's going mm -hmm. in there and wanting to pair their wines with their foods and have an hour and a half experience. And they're going to probably go there once every couple of weeks, three weeks is what we want. Certainly a very different occasion. Very even different if it's occasion. the same person. Yeah, yeah, exactly right. And so the way that you communicate with them and invest into them, um, very different. Mm -hmm. And what they care for is very, very different. Well, look, let's touch on the guest acquisition piece and the, the, the customer acquisition cost element. In the book, we, we talk about a ROAS best in class that we've heard of around 10 to 1. I'm curious what it is for you guys. And really, how do you think about spending on marketing? You know, one of the things we often try to advocate for is saying, when you look at the fee on a marketplace, actually see that as a marketing cost. Uh, because that is acquiring potential guests potentially to be acquired in, potentially to be converted into your first party channel. But how do you guys look at guest acquisition? Yeah, you said in the book it's 10 to 1. In the, yes, in our past digital maturity that we say. Yeah, I would say that that's accurate. I mean, it's very close to how we, we feel about it as well. And I think that when we, we look at how many dollars we spend to acquiring, it used to be a couple of years ago when traffic was good, but we wanted to get more, everybody always wants more, that we would lean more into the marketing dollars of gaining new consumers. and Right now, it's actually shifted to where we're literally almost pouring all dollars into keeping the consumers that we have. Mm. We think that if the consumer comes and then they bring their friends and say, hey, you gotta come check out this place, that's gonna be less costly than going out and trying to c compete in the very noisy, crowded space of marketing right now with restaurants. Mm. And I think a lot of the marketing tech that has come to me um, saying, hey, we want to put this in all the saver brands across the board, um, there's too many of them. And a lot of them are still, I think, early. So you don't know if they're going to work or not either. So marketing is very, very expensive. And I think that the customer acquisition cost used to be better. I think it's actually going up right now. Yeah. And when I look at that, I think it's going up because it's not working, if you ask me. I think that we have to consume the data that we have and we have to communicate with consumers. Mm -hmm. We do advocate a lot in the book, again, learning from e-commerce about the importance of A-B testing and actually the yeah. encouragement to restaurants to do small tests to be able to see what tactic, which promotional metric works even to the degree of being able to test at different times of the week, yep. uh, which of course is something that's available now. Uh, does that level of experimentation form part of the way you guys approach it? A hundred percent. So A-B testing you have to do, number one. Um, you'll, you'll usually say, okay, I have $10,000 to spend or whoever's listening, $1,000 to spend because you don't always have to spend a lot to get, get results. But you, you do have to say there's two different strategies, which one from the, 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 the tech company, which one is the one that's working the most? Well, this one's working a little more effectively. Okay, then I'm gonna do seven to three dollars, and then we're gonna test. And then usually you can test it within two to three days to see what the reaction is. And then you can shift along the way. You don't have to go a month or two months or three months. The nice thing about technology is you can get that data quickly, mm -hmm. and then you can shift to whichever one's working better. But A-B testing is what we do with every dollar we spend on marketing right now. Well, that yeah. is such an incredible difference from the old days of I'm going to put oh, something yeah. on TV, I'm going we'll to test see. it in an entire market. Six months, how did it go? <laughs> <laughs> right? Did people come in? Well, with A-B testing too, I think that people think that with A-B testing you you send it out and then you you wait for the results. I think with A-B testing or just testing technology and spend anyway, you have to watch it consistently every day. I think people get busy and they go, okay, I've got marketing channel going. You know, and I've mm -hmm. got my loyalty dollars spent, and I've got my marketing on 3PD channels going, and they have all the things going, then they just go back to work, and they hope that they just come in the door. Mm -hmm. You've got to watch them, and you've got to see which ones are working, which ones are not, and if you're not willing to, to pivot or dial up one and then dial down another, then you've just spent money, and you're probably not going to see the results you want. Don't. But that's what you want with tech. And do you feel, as you look across channels, that you're able to get that same feedback 
from a third party, as from a first party order, as from Google order, as you were talking about previously. Three PD has been hard, right? I think that the, it's. I'm not going to say everything I feel about 3PD. <laughs> I think all of us feel one way or the other about 3PD, but 3PD, the data is what they like to hold hostage a little bit. And you really have to negotiate to get your data back so that you know how it's working. When you do it through your own website and they're doing online ordering, even if you use dispatch through one of the 3PD services, much better because you can actually see the inbound and you can see the ticket size and price and how frequent they are with their loyalty number. Um, but data has been tough. Google is a little better. We feel like Google has been probably a better partner. Yelp is also very, very tough. Um, seems to me that you don't get the good data unless you pay a fee. Mm. You want the good data, and so you have to pay a fee to get the good data, and then you actually see, wow, people actually really do like this. It's not just all the negatives. It's so interesting because you would think they would have a vested interest in having all of the merchants driving frequency, yeah. driving basket on platform, and they would want to give the merchants that data so that they could do what it takes to drive those numbers. Um, seems backwards. And I don't, I can't tell if that's because they're busy driving frequency and basket on platform, you know, having nothing to do with the merchants, or if that's just because they're early in their creation of the platform, and so they haven't gotten sophisticated around the release of that data. Yeah, I'd like to sit in those tech platform meetings, talking about what we're building next, just to see what all of the strategy is, what because I don't really understand about. the strategy. Right now. Well, th their loyalty program's all around Dash Pass and, uh, and the yeah. ability to get people to visit their platform more often, and whether they're vested in the recurring customer to a brand, I think, yeah. is, the, is the big friction point there. Mm -hmm. Definite friction point. Mm -hmm. So the amazing thing about all of this data that exists in restaurants now is that it can translate all the way back through operations and get into things like predictive forecasting across the savory brands. How are you using the data that you receive to make the operations better too? Yeah, so every Q4, we do planning and budgeting, forecasting for the following year. And we have our board meetings come January, and our investment teams for every one of our platform companies will sit down with the CFO or the VP of Finance of each brand, and we actually look at all of the data that comes in, um, from the locations to the revenues to the the type of clientele that's coming in the door to the spend. We, we look at how much people are dining in, how much are going through drive through how much are ordering online. All of that data then is put into the forecasting models that we put in to say, is it going down or up on digital? And then do we build bigger dining rooms in those locations or smaller dining rooms? Do we add a drive through or do we take the drive throughs away because those are costly on in the inside of a restaurant? What things are you doing to your business itself to then build out more the following year? And then the following year after that, because you're looking for real estate for a whole year prior to when you build, as you know. Um, but those decisions are made in how we're going to project the business and how much we as a fund are going to invest into the business and how much cash flow gets out of that business. So data is the only way you live and breathe in restaurants. It used to be just like, if I have extra cash in the till at the end of the day, I've made money. Now you're looking at, I mean, I can't even tell you how many pieces of data sets we're looking at um, to make the decisions that we make for the following year. Hmm. And is that starting to get uh, more real time? Are you starting to use machine learning and AI to be able to affect your scheduling, your forecasting, more day-to-day -day things, or is it more a long-term view that you're it, taking? We, so we do have a long-term financial model. We call that an LTFM. Look at that. I so, love yeah, great you didn't, letters. You didn't even know. <laughs> so we do, we do an LTFM, and then we do a budget and actual. But we use a lot of the data to predict short term as well. So we'll predict for January where we're going to be. We give that, those budgets to the leadership team. And the data that's coming out on a daily, weekly, monthly basis, it's then layered in over that. And then we look at the variance and then we figure out why. AI is tough right now because we looked at it. We try to hire AI specialists to build you know, models within AI to get us information. I feel like it's still not there 100%. Mm -hmm. I think it's coming and it's exciting to me because it's going to take a fleet of people, right, sitting at a desk, trying to figure something out, it's going to be minutes instead of a month. But we just haven't used AI enough yet. I think I it's coming. I don't think it's there. I don't, I don't, think, I don't it's, think it's that you haven't used it enough. I think it's that it has not been used yeah, enough. I don't think it's, <laughs> I don't think it's there. It gets a lot of air time. It's not truly AI. It's you know, not there. I mean, I know that it's helping all the kids in high school right now, but it's not helping us. Yeah. <laughs> one, one, one last question for you, Andrew, before we, before we finish up. and. and Lovely to put you an investor hat on for us because yeah. I was speaking to um, 12, 13 CIOs the other day about the challenge they have in their executive circles have been able to say about how to invest in a piece of technology, the dollar that you put into a piece of restaurant technology versus the dollar you put into a new site. Mm. How do you look at investing into digitization versus into a new unit or a new brand? 
Yeah, it's a good question because I had a brand that we bought into and I looked at it and I thought, we could do what we do, which is scale. We're a scale shop. We know how to scale. We have 80 people back at our office. We're not a traditional private equity firm because we're operating GPs. So we buy into the brand, we partner with the founder, and then we help scale and grow it. And the things that you have to put in place are the people, process, and systems to make sure that that happens. We always look at the tech underbelly of a business and we think if we don't get the right tech stack in place and you don't have the right systems in place, you can't grow. It just doesn't matter. So I always look at a brand and say, do we need more stores or do we want more revenue and profits with what we have? We bought into this brand about five years ago and I thought we could easily add more units here because the cost of building them out was pretty low. And so the cash and cash returns were mind boggling at that, that point in time. I thought there's another 10 to 15% of the store level that we could get out of these business, out of these businesses that we currently have. So where everybody was pushing is that, let's grow, let's grow, let's grow. This is gonna be a fun, fun brand. I said, let's pause and perfect. Let's plant our ground, let's get the right tech underbelly on this, and let's get the throughput of these stores and these drive-throughs much higher. So mm -hmm. things like um, the uh, the timer on the drive-through alone, and then you put the loop in the drive-through so that you know when they finally made their order, to what time they have, and then how long they're out the window and then out. It was like a minute and a half for someone that should have been through there in 35 seconds, in my mind. Wow. We got it to 50 seconds, and then 40 seconds, and then 35, and then we got it to 22 seconds at the window, which is fast. That's amazing. And you probably know what brand it is, but um, when we did that, we literally three times the profit on the same block of stores. I mean, it was millions of dollars. Wow. Just because of technology, throughput, and then learning what our customer wanted. And learning when they had the line buster out there with the iPad, that all they had to do was put in the number and it would come up and say, oh, I see that this is what your product is, is what you want again, yes. Put your credit card on there, not take cash anymore, send them through, and then we knew that that customer was coming three to four times a week. Mm -hmm. So then we said, well, we wanna make sure that we can stay, Carl. So when you pull up, what's your phone number? Put it in, Carl, how are you doing? Would you still like this product? Yes, I would. Here you go, buy it, and then you're through. That's what sped it up. And just because of technology and watching that data, it's three times the profit of that business, and then we started to grow it but it's been a magical story because of that underbelly that we put there. Yeah, those amazing cash on cash returns oh, were too ridiculous. Cash too cash. ridiculous cash on cash. <laughs> and then we hit the 2020 thing and then logistics and supplies and then now those costs have gone back up, which <laughs> sucks. The, the lovely thing about that is, yes, 3x profitability, but also a nice little sprinkling of hospitality as well, oh, right? So yeah. the consumer, their, their sentiment went higher. They yeah. liked us more, they became galvanized with our, with our brand, with our team. It, it helps not just for throughput and more money, it helps because you actually make a customer more loyal to you for a lifetime, mm -hmm. truly. You can have a copycat open across the street, doesn't matter, they're gonna to come to you. Right. Well, look, I think that's a great place to finish it up. Andrew, thank you so much for joining us, really appreciate yeah. it. Good luck to you and the team at Savory. We're thank looking you. forward to seeing what comes in the, in the months and years so ahead. So am I. <laughs> the Digital Restaurant Podcast is available for you to follow and subscribe wherever you listen to your podcasts. Watch us, rate us, and subscribe to The Digital Restaurant on YouTube and follow along on all our social media digital restaurant channels. Thanks for listening.